Right. Hello, everybody. Uh, I feel that my first hurdle has been handled in that I didn't bump my head on the way through, <laughs> which is a good start. Um, I've got about an hour's worth of material that I want to share and, <laughs> and 17 odd minutes to do that. But before I continue, I usually take this moment to just pause because at this point, some of you are confused because you are thinking, how is it possible that this voice is coming out of this body? <laughs> I can assure you this is my real voice. This is how I actually talk. Do not be befuddled by it for the, for the entire period of the talk. I have been trying to decide exactly what I want to talk about. It's really difficult because there are so many things, and I know we've seen some of these people who have spoken earlier, some of these instigators, and they are remarkable. And I, I suppose that's what's led me to kind of move in this direction. Hopefully they won't mind. Sometimes we hear these stories about the things people are doing, and they are so big. They are so big that we fall into the trap of thinking that in order to make a difference ourselves, we too must do things that are of such scale, that they are global, that they make the entire world stand up, or at least a crowd in front of you to, your, to their feet. And, and I really believe something different. I believe that it is the everyday interactions. It is the everyday opportunities to be an instigator that really counts. I'm almost sure that a big part of the reason I'm up here is because I had the temerity to remind sports fans back in 2007 that gay people don't just, I don't know, bring them their drinks on a plane or, <laughs> or do their hair. But indeed, they look like this sometimes, and they play sport quite well. And so... We need to remind people sometimes. And, and, and even that, people think it's like, that's that big, they can name the date. It was 2007, I wrote a book about it, I went about there and I talked to everybody about it. And they think, again, it's that pivotal moment thing where the, the size and the scale of this amazing thing that hopefully changes people's minds. And I hope it did help change people's minds a little bit, but what people don't realize is it's the small things before that that, that really make the difference. For example, before I decided to come out publicly, I was perfectly happy being out like any regular person, which is to the people who care about you, not just to random strangers in the street, uh, which I can tell you is a very unusual experience. Uh, and, and I was happy that way. Um, certainly some of the pressures of being a visible role model were, were absent, but I, I thought that it was enough. And then I went back to England, after I retired in 2005, I went back to England, and in that summer I went to, um, I just dropped in on Manchester Pride. I was, I was never a big Pride person, but I dropped in on it because it's in Manchester, it's my hometown, why not? And frankly, in Manchester, being gay is about as du jour as being a football fan, it's just not a big deal. Um, so I, I thought I would, and I, and I went to watch the beginning of the parade. And I stood in the grounds of the cathedral, um, which I, I struck me as kind of ironic, but anyway. <laughs> and I'm standing there, and I'm watching the beginning of the parade get together, and, and it starts, and they start streaming through, and I suddenly notice there's this kid, this boy, 13, maybe 14, and he's just hiding behind one of the trees in the cathedral gardens. He's just peeking and watching. You can tell he doesn't really want to be seen, and yet he wants to see what's going on. And then all of a sudden, the Grand Marshal appears in his big pink Cadillac, of course. <laughs> and, it's, and it's Gandalf. It's Ian McKellen. <laughs> it's a hot day in Manchester, which is a rarity. And he's wearing the tightest pair of leather pants I've ever seen. I've had the pleasure of getting to know Ian McKellen, and this is not an unusual thing for him, I have to say. But then he's doing this thing where he's just waving regally. And because it's Manchester, there's grand grandmas and granddads with their blue rinse, waving back, loving every second of it. And then there's this kid just watching. And, and then all of a sudden, Ian McKellen is waving generally at everybody, and he turns towards our general direction. 
and he waves. And you watch this kid, and he, he believes that Ian McKellen has waved at him. And you watch him, and he glowed. And he stepped out from behind this tree, and he waved back. And then he looked really self-conscious, and then stood back. But just for that moment, I thought, wow, I mean, I recognize I'm no, I'm no Gandalf. But at the same time, if I came out publicly, maybe I could have that kind of impact too. But the big thing that I tried to do was predicated on witnessing a tiny thing that some, that's happened to somebody else. I think this is the way we instigate. This is the way we change. We don't all have to be so remarkable as some of these people. I certainly am not. But what I do is regard in every moment there is something remarkable that we can do with our interactions. I had that lesson taught to me at a very early age. My mother was a doctor in the north of England. And when I was seven years old, I used to go on visits with her. Not out of any kind of, I didn't want to experience it. It wasn't that, it was simply that if I was left at home with my two sisters, we fought so terribly that we had to be separated. So I went on visits and, and we go to the houses of these families that were very sick. Somebody in the family was very sick. Often it was palliative, so they weren't going to get better. And my mother would sit me down in the front room, and she would go upstairs and do doctory stuff. And I started to associate a noise with this, with this experience, because this is in the 70s. And back in the 70s, in England, when the doctor visits, you get your best china out. It's a, how times have changed. And the noise I would associate with this experience, the stress in the room that I could feel the tension in the house the moment you open the door. You'd sit down with these scared and frightened people, and they would hand me a bone china cup on a bone china saucer, and I was seven years old, and their hands would be shaking because of the stress, and there was this tinkling noise that was made. And then I would take the cup and saucer, and my hands would be shaking because I'm seven years old and I'm holding bone china. And then my mother would come downstairs. She only had two or three minutes in every house. And they would hand her a cup, and the noise would stop. And she held it rock solid. And then she would look around the room at all the people in it, and it was as if she was gathering them up in her attention. And then she would talk and explain to them what was happening and how we were going to proceed. And then they'd always protest, Dr. Amici, I can't do it. I just, I can't cope anymore. What if this happens? What if that happens? I don't know what to do. And I watched while this happened, and I, and I just thought, you know, this is desperate. And then all of a sudden, my mother would just cut through their objections and say, you can do this. You can cope. Wave her hands in front of them, and they would immediately pay attention. Then they would protest, oh, daughter, and she would say, no. This is what you're going to do. This is how we're going to cope. This is, what, this is our strategy until I see you next in 10 days or two weeks. And even at seven years old, I could feel the tension in the room drop. And it wasn't that everybody thought that they, everything was going to be all right. Whoever was sick was going to be better instantly. It wasn't that. Sometimes they were never going to get better. But what it was, was that they felt suddenly empowered to cope, able to manage. And even at seven years old, I thought this was remarkable until I saw something else that made me think it was even more remarkable. Because for those of you of an age, you will recognize that in 1977, the best thing ever to happen happened. And that was the original Star Wars came out. <laughs> None of this Jar Jar Binks nonsense. In 1977, that film came out, and I must have seen it about 11 times. And most of the times I watched it after the first it was really because I thought I saw something in the movie that I saw every day. And there's a scene in the original Star Wars. It's about 43 and a half minutes in, approximately. <laughs> where the Obi-Wan Kenobi's in the speeder and Luke's next to him and the droids are in the back and they're swooping into Mos Eisley. And all of a sudden, they get stopped by the stormtroopers. And the stormtroopers say, these are the droids we're looking for. And Obi-Wan Kenobi looks at them and says, these aren't the droids you're looking for. And they repeat back, these aren't the droids you're looking for. He tells the stormtroopers, we can move along. The stormtroopers say, move along, move along. They escape, save the universe. We know how it ends. 
So I watch this, and then I go back and I'm in these living rooms. There's noise, and then there's nothing. There's tension, and then there's nothing. I'm like, I've seen this. And so from about the age of seven till forever, I was reasonably convinced that my mother was a Jedi. <laughs> I just knew it. And I even started to create explanations as to why she wasn't talking to me about it. Because it was like, you know, Obi-Wan Kenobi only talked to Luke when he was a teenager and I was seven, so clearly there was some time. There's a maturation process here we have to respect. And so I understood very clearly that this was just, mm -mm, I figured it out, but we've got to keep quiet about it. But I knew I needed to do some research, so next to my mom's surgery, there's a, there was a library. And I went one day when we came back after doing a sequence of visits, I went, I'm just going to the library, it's like nothing. Walked over to the library and I put my hands on the desk and I looked at the librarian and I said to her, I need some books about becoming a Jedi. <laughs> and she said to me, the Star Wars books are over there. And I remember, just, I put my hands on the desk again and I just shook my head. I said, you misunderstand me. And I explained to her that my mother did this, and then people did what she said, and Obi-Wan, he did this. I said, I need some books about that. She said, that sounds like psychology. And I remember very distinctly looking at her and saying, you can call it what you like. <laughs> but this was my education into how individually, in tiny moments, we can make big changes. They don't have to be these massive, pivotal moments, right? They don't have to be these times that we can both predict and prepare for. Sometimes they're just everyday interactions with people that radically changes how they think and feel, how they're able to cope. And, I, and my life has continued to give me opportunities to understand this in remarkable ways. I, my heyday, it's embarrassing to even use that, but my heyday in basketball was playing for the Orlando Magic. I was good back then, not superstar, not great, but good. Started, but at the beginning of the year, in the summer, I showed up in Orlando, and they weren't sure they were going to keep me. I knew this because I'd gone into the office, Doc Rivers' office, and I looked on the board, and there was a whiteboard with a depth chart. One, two, three, four, five. There I was, four and five positions, bottom. There were, for the five position, there were five people ahead of me. I was like, this doesn't bode well. And then I looked again, and I was like, next to my name, it said dash English. <laughs> I was like, am I really so far down because of the way I talk? <laughs> That's crazy. But anyway, I saw this, and I was like, I must do something about this. And they had this amazing facility, one half of it uh, private just for the team, the other half public for anybody. So I used to come in, practice with the team in the morning, and then it had this hand scan to get in, so I couldn't get in any other time than when I followed in on the bumper of my teammates to get into the car park. So the rest of the time, I went to the public part, and I worked out, did my sprints, did my shooting, whatever I thought I needed to do. And one day I'm there, I've done my work, halfway through maybe, I take a seat and I'm having a drink on the bench, and suddenly my spider sense is tingling, and there's there's somebody in my space. I'm like, adults should be at work, because it's one o'clock, kids should be in school, this place should be mine. <laughs> and yet there were two kids down here, and I looked over, and they really bothered me, because I was like, these aren't part of my plan. I've got a strategy. I've got to get up this depth chart, and this is a distraction. But they kept on looking at me, and I thought it was because I was wearing magic gear, and they were like, oh, that's one of those special NBA guys. And I wandered over, and I introduced myself. Hi, I'm John Amici from The Magic. <laughs> <laughs> of course, they didn't know who I was. I was bottom of the depth chart, right? So <laughs> they introduced themselves. Hi, my name's Chris. Hi, my name's Eric. I, you should be in school, right? No, nah, no, nah, we're good. <laughs> and I, I felt like, you know what, this is not my problem. I, I've done what I'm supposed to do. They looked at me like I should come over and say hello. 
That look that every parent or manager of people should know. The look that says, I'm afraid to come over and talk to you, but I'd love it if you talk to me. And I, and I did my duty and I went over there. They went about their business. I finished my workout. I looked over, they'd gone. I come back the next day. There they are. I go over, I say, Chris, Eric, how are you doing? Shouldn't you be in school? No, no, we've got a special pass. Whatever. I got to know these kids over the course of the year. My family was in England. I've got no one to give my tickets to, so I gave them tickets to the games. I learned about their circumstances, which were difficult, to say the least. In the summer, I even brought them to England to come to my basketball camp. And on day two, I hear this scream from another court, and I look, and it's Chris, he's broken his ankle. We call the ambulance, he's in the ambulance, and he's screaming because of the pain, but he's on gas and air, so he's laughing because of the gas and air, and then screaming because of the pain. It's a, a really weird and horrible combination. <clears throat> and just before we get to the hospital, he pulls the mask down and says, uh, will you take care of us? And naturally, I felt the same thing that any adult in that situation would feel, which is, wow, you're really manipulating me right now. <clears throat> you're 5,000 miles away from home with a broken ankle, and now you're going to make the big ask? Wow. It took me about 24 hours, because I, the first thing I thought was, like, this is not part of my plan. I've got a strategy. I'm at the top of that depth chart. I'd like to stay there. This is not part of my plan. It took me 24 hours, and I was like, yep, I'll do it. I like to believe that's my mother's influence. Anyway, I ended up adopting Chris and Eric, and now I'm a granddad of four, which is crazy. I tell you this not because I think that is a remarkable or big thing, though I do think it's the best thing I've ever done, but because I thought I knew why it happened. I thought I had found pivotal moments that I had predicted and prepared for. Chris had asked me, I'd taken 24 hours, I reflected, I said yes, and that's why I'm a granddad of four. And that was until about six years ago when I went to Thanksgiving dinner. I do all holidays that involve food, American or English, frankly. <laughs> I go to Thanksgiving, and uh, after, after the meal, Chris and Eric are there, and I'm, we're on the balcony. Apparently, that's what you do. You go outside and muse. <laughs> and Chris looks at me, and he says, do you know why we chose you? <laughs> Which is odd, right? And I was like, of course I do. Instant NBA dad. I play for the Magic, right? <laughs> How cool is that? And he, he looked at me absolutely deadpan and said, uh, you weren't that good. <laughs> Which was wounding, but also true. So I said, well, all right, if it's not that, why was it? And he said, well, do you remember the first time we met? I said, of course I do, you should have been in school. I said, yep. He said, do you remember the second time we met? Yeah, of course. He said, we knew you were the one, because the second time we met, you remembered our names. That was it. That tiny thing, not big, not massive, not, not something that we couldn't all do. That tiny thing and my universe split, their universe split. A path that was inconceivable for both of us suddenly became illuminated. This is the nature of instigation. This is what we can all do every day. We can choose to make sure that the massive numbers of interactions we have on a daily basis we use. We're actually present, mindful, in attendance. If we do that, we can change the world. One person at a time, one experience at a time. Think of this and remember that we can all be Jedi. Thank you.